Welcome to a Neon Jazz interview with an innovator leading the music march in modern jazz these days and one of the finest pianists going, Mr. Matthew Shipp. Born and raised in Delaware, these days he is based out of the Big Apple in New York City. He recently spoke with Neon Jazz about all those early experiences in life that made him fall in love with jazz. His early gigs, the profound influence of David S. Ware in gigging with him, what's going on these days with his new album of solos, and who he would love to meet if he climbed into that proverbial jazz time machine, and how he wants the world to remember his musical legacy, along with much, much more. Please dig it. Matthew Shipp. All right, let's have it. Hey, Joe Domino, Neon Jazz. Yes, sir. How are you, sir? All right. Good, man. Hey, you ready to go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, man. So you were born and raised in Delaware. Was that kind of a hotbed of jazz back in the day? Um, well, Delaware has a great history. Clifford Brown is from Delaware, and it's also um, 20 minutes away from Philadelphia, and, you know, Coltrane used to live in Philadelphia, and um, there was a you know, Philly has such a great historical jazz presence that the spirit of that was kind of alive in Wilmington, Delaware, even though it had its own scene based mainly on the memory of Clifford Brown. So, so the, historically, there was a lot of resonance there. Right on. So your mom was friends with Clifford ba Brown. How did that influence you and your family and your love of jazz? Uh, well, she had the records first of all, and that was... <laughs> The major thing, and you know, she just used to tell stories and the whole mythology, if you want to call that, you know, about that whole thing was just very alive in our household. So. Right on. So, talk to me about your family. How influential were they with with you getting into music and kind of as you live today? How how does that resonate in your bones? Well, my father was a, is a retired police captain, and my mother was a nurse, and. Um, they were always just kind of had a lot of curiosity about a lot of things. So it wasn't so much that they were jazz freaks, but like any couple in their, like, like a lot of couples in the early 60s, and um, they would, like, I think I remember they, they used to get Esquire magazine, and you know, things that were hip yeah. in a magazine like that they bought. So they had, like, a lot of um, um, different albums, some things by Miles, um, they had, some Kid Ellington, some Count Basie, Dave Rubeck stuff, and then, you know, the Clifford Brown because it was Wilmington based. So there was just like a decent record collection in the house. Plus, they had a lot of classical music also. And they listened to a whole variety of things. So, even though they were curious, I kind of grew up as a curious person also. And I explored their record collection. And they, you know, they were very, very pleased that I was interested in, in the music until. They found out I was going to try to make a living doing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, you know, <laughs> that's always the wall, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I read in one of your bios that at the age of 12, something happened that made you fall in love with jazz. What was that? Um, TV backfired, whereas TV usually is um, destroys your brain. In, in this case, I saw on public TV Amal Jamal and Nina Simone both do concerts and it actually um, got me really interested in pursuing the music just seeing those two live on TV right on um, and you know the Maud Jamal thing there was just like a, a coolness to it that I really liked and the Nina Simone thing was very scary and powerful in that way yeah and um, you know so they both both of those seeing that both of those concerts on public TV really kind of crystallized everything for me what I wanted to do sure so let's talk let's talk a little bit about teaching here moving on from from an inspiration um, it's said that you uh, were taught by Dennis Sandel who taught John Coltrane what was that like what kind of influence did he have on your playing and kind of your whole view of jazz music right. um, Dennis Sandel what's his name he's a teacher in Philly Coltrane study with him well, I mean a lot of people did Art Farmer went through his workshops, so um, James Moody. Um, well, Dennis has like what he calls an extensive language. Um, I don't, it's hard to call it, you know, that's really hard to explain very quickly, but he basically wrote lines for his students and he claimed to be able to kind of see into their souls and see their musical personalities before it was even formed. And he could write lines for you based on you. Now, if you look at the lines he wrote for all his students, there are 
similar in the principles, but they are, each one's different. And it's, it's a kind of a situation where you go in every week and you play your line and he, he reacts to what you play and writes something else for it. And it's, it, it just keeps going on and on and on. And there's other parts of the, his teaching method too. But he's one, really one of the great jazz teachers. There's, um, I, I guess I was going to say there's five or six, but there's, there's great jazz teachers in every geographical area. But there's a few that had students that, you know, kind of changed history. So their, their legend as a teacher grows because of that. And Dennis is, John Coltrane is, you know, definitely one of those. Yeah. And if you read any of the Coltrane biographies, Coltrane attributes a huge part of his development to Sandoli, his relationship with him. Right on. And Dennis was just a great guy, too. I mean, he was really somebody who was just very passionate about teaching and his students all really loved him. In fact, you know, he died in 2000 and there's a Facebook page where his students now still assemble and just, you know, constantly praising him with the time they spent with the maestro. You know? Right on, right on. So let me ask you this. You moved from Delaware to New York City. What kind of culture shock, what kind of uh, influence did that have on you really getting into the jazz? Well, I was, um, I mean, I was, um, I moved to New York to establish a career. I mean, I was, my style had kind of fallen together the year before that. I actually moved to Boston before I moved to New York, and then I moved to New York. I was only in Boston for a year. Um, it was, I mean, I've always wanted to live in New York, and I've kind of always mentally prepared myself before I did. I, I often say when I was a kid, a little, little kid, when I used to watch The Odd Couple, I used to always fantasize, like, I was walking around New York, around Central Park and stuff. <laughs> I, it's like I always knew I was going to live in New York. You know, I have an uncle and an aunt that lives here. My uncle lived in the Bronx, and my aunt used to live on 34th Street. And we used to come visit him as a kid. And it's just like I always knew I was going to live in New York from the time I was like five or six. So I was, I felt at home the first day I moved here. I was like a revelation to me in a good way. It, it just spirit of New York was everything I always thought and more. And um, it, I just fit in here like a glove in, in New York and myself. So right on. there was no culture shock whatsoever. Right on. Very cool. What was your first gig like? When you played live for the first time, what was that like? What was going through your brain? Never. Yeah. Okay, my first, I mean, when you say gig, I mean, because I did like recitals as a kid. Uh, my piano teacher used to have a series every year, you know, where her students would play and stuff. But as far as the first jazz gig I did, I can't even remember. I mean, I, I would have been a teenager, and I was playing straight ahead, uh -huh. very straight ahead gigs. You know, I had a trio that was sort of in the mold of the Bill Evans trio. And I also had a quartet that kind of would have been in the mold of a, the John Coltrane quartet. And I, I would say I was probably pretty confident. I had also been... As a, playing as a church musician probably ever since I was like about 10 years old so um, by that point by the time I started doing jazz gigs I was a very confident public performer um, th there was one point when I was younger when I was doing you know some like little classical recitals that my teacher would put on stuff that I used to get stage fright and things but I actually went to a hypnotist mm -hmm. study and over overcome stage fright and it kind of worked you know so and then by the time I was performing like with the jazz trio or something which I would have been about maybe 14 or 15 I was a very confident performer maybe over, overconfident <laughs> <You know? laughs> for, for, for the level I was playing on at the time which was a decent level but you know when you're that young you don't really have that much to say you know sure well, and speaking of, with all the years of wisdom and mileage behind you, how do you approach a gig these days versus when you were younger? What's a big difference? Well, well, I think when I you're younger, you, you always trying to make a point. You know, you, you're always very concerned about making an impact. I think these days, <laughs> I'm 53, so you know, you're concerned about getting through the gig without your back full. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're not, I, I don't feel the need to have to prove anything. I just try to really relax into the music and let the music speak. And right. there's not any, like, you know, I mean, like, for instance, even if you go on stage, I, 
I remember when I was in my early, my late teens, a mentor of mine who was not a, a teacher, but he was a guy that I used to go to for kind of wisdom and things. He always used to say to me, you know, what makes Miles Davis great? And I go, what? He goes, he gets up on stage and his hat and his, it is, it's not, it's not, yeah. And, like, and it's not like, yeah. That is what, he did, which was kind of a strange thing to say, but yeah. but you know, it's just at a certain point you just really let the music take over, and you're not trying to prove anything. Sure, absolutely. So when you when you have a chance to sit down and you think, you know, I want to listen to somebody on jazz piano, who do you really love listening to playing the keys? Uh, well, I love a lot of pianists, but if I I would say if I was at this point, if I was just sitting down for pleasure, and I, it would probably be Bud Power and Monk. Right on. Mainly. And then Paul Play, mm -hmm. in some ways now, and Andrew Hill. But that's probably, and if I am really um, need to go back, it would be Fats Waller. Right on. Right on. So, the amount of projects that you've been involved with over the years, either as a leader or as a sideman, is just boggling. There's been so many projects that you've been a part of. If you ever just lean back, close your eyes, and think, man, that that project was awesome, what comes to mind? Probably my time period with the David S. Ware Quartet. Cool. Just because it was really great to be involved with a um, quartet of that nature, with a saxophone tenor player with a big sound. When I was younger, I, I used to always fantasize about playing with Farrell Sanders, which never happened, but playing with somebody like David kind of satisfied that need to play with a big tenor in a, in a group that is after the cold chain quartet, but that has the same type of spiritual sheen, and, you know. I mean, the people that are fans of that band think that, you know. So uh, probably that was that's one thing I'm very glad that I was a part of. What did David teach you about life? Um, well, the thing that was really cool about David is he was really centered in being David. And he was, um, you know, had a way of going about things. He had a, and he was just very adamant about sticking to his game plan, no matter what. Like, and, you know, he was just really very austere with how he did everything and how he was willing to you know, to take the punches along the line if, if it didn't work out the way he wanted, but he just never veered from his vision. And just seeing that in action, really, really, you know, I've always kind of been of that mindset, but seeing somebody really do that, you know, it's kind of stunning, actually. Yeah, sure, sure. So where do you love to perform? What, what are some cities, some venues that you're like, man, I just can't wait to get back there? Um, I really like playing in, beautiful churches. I played in this cathedral. I mean, I just, especially at the resonance and the, and the sounds bouncing around in, in a certain way. I played in this big cathedral once in Prague and that was just really... And then a couple of towns in Italy, I played in um, like cathedrals and it's just the sound and, and just the whole vibe of it was really cool. But I like, I mean, I like, it's, it's more the people than the place. I mean, I really love playing in, in Holland. Especially um, Rotterdam and Amsterdam, cool. and I like playing. But I, I just like playing for people, no yeah. matter where. So absolutely, if, if the people want to hear the music, I, I, I'm in the, sitting down and playing it. Right on. Let me ask you this: If you could go back in time and meet one jazz musician, any time period, anybody, who would it be and why? Well, can I name two people? Absolutely. Um, Bud Powell, because he's just like my favorite pianist, and I, I really kind of, um, I, I just, I can't believe him when I hear him. I mean, it's just like, it's incomprehensible the level he plays at. Yeah. And I, I just, I worship him, so <laughs> that's why I like to meet him. Right on. And I'd be actually kind of curious to meet Johann Sebastian Bach. I, it just seems, first of all, I'd really like to hear him. He yeah. revised one of, one, of, one of those old organs in one of those Lutheran churches and, and um, just hear like what his language was like as it seeped out of his brain on an organ. That would be, uh, you know, I, I would, that would be, I just can't imagine what that would be like. And um, I, I'm just curious what drove him because he's just so prodigious his whole life and, and on, you know, the highest level possible. So. Absolutely.
Absolutely. Those, those, those are probably the two people I'd like to meet. Right on. So what's going on these days with Matthew Shep as far as projects, uh, touring? What, what What's going on these days? Well, my new solo piano album, I've been to many places, is the main thing I'm focusing on right now. It just came out. And um, I will, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm like getting ready to head on a duo tour of my bassist, Mike Bizio. So I'm basically playing solo and duo. I was doing a lot of trio concerts, but my drummer got sick for a while. He's recovering, and you know, he'll be back on it soon. But while he's recovering, I've been doing duos with my bassist, Michael Bissio, and a lot of solo gigs, and that's where my focus is right now. Right on. What, what's next for you to accomplish in a, in a career that has established you as one of the finest pianists in jazz? You've had a lot of accolades. What, what is left? What do you want to do next? Well, I mean, despite all the accolades I, I, I get, and it's got, there's a lot of major festivals I never played at. And I basically, I mean, the only thing I really want to do is just play all the major festivals. <laughs> I like just the work. Cool. <laughs> I mean, which I do, you know, work a decent amount. But I, I want to, there's a lot of major festivals I've just never played, and I really want to get to them all. Right on. What What's the best compliment a fan has ever stopped and said to you? I, I would be embarrassed to say it. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I guess if you really want to hear I can tell you, but it's kind of embarrassing. I mean, because it's, it's so over the top. Yeah. But I. Uh, I think I had it was a Japanese woman once. I was in San Francisco, and um, I was just we were waiting for the bus, and she just walked over to me. She said, "You don't know me. I'm a big fan of yours." But she goes, "You don't know me." But I just had to say that the specific language you play speaks to me so intently that I can't listen to anything. And then she said, "Other than what you do," and she said, "I even," I can't, she goes, "I can't even listen to culture in your mouth, dude." Wow. And she just said that. The language I play specifically for whatever reason touched your soul in just such a personal way that wow. she felt that I was existed just for her spiritual edification. Wow. <laughs> I was just like looking at her like she was crazy. <laughs> now, you know, I said to her, I said, well, that's a personal thing. Like, I'm glad what I do touches you, but you should listen to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, and I understand that sometimes some people's brains are wired in a certain way where one language really does speak to you know and I guess that's what that was but wow that was so that's cool that's very cool um let me let me ask you this and this kind of rotates around every once in a while um in the world of journalism and just the world of people talking about jazz you hear which I don't know how this started, and I find it absurd, but you'll hear jazz is dead. When you hear that term, what do you think? When I hear jazz is dead or jazz. I mean, some people will say that sometimes. They're just like, yeah, jazz is dead, or, you know, it's it's not what it used to be. I mean, what right. What do you think? What's the, What goes through your head when you hear that? Well, I think, first of all, I think the main problem is um, the way the jazz industry has marketed stuff so they basically everything is right now is based on the 70s and the people that play with Miles Davis so it's been kind of really hard for anybody to establish a career where people take you seriously as somebody who's actually doing something with the music I mean when I think of you know I mean since people my age are you know younger the only careers really been able to establish was went in the 90s in this well late 70s actually and um, and then other than that, you know, Brad Malibu to some extent, but even with somebody like Brad or something, it only, it only goes so far. Like you, you can never get kind of the swagger that Keith Jarrett or Harry Hancock or Chick Corea or people that came along in the seventies got. So the jazz industry is kind of stuck in the late seventies, and it makes it impossible to put out an image to people that the music is still alive, and you know, it's not just a historical thing. Um, so I think it just needs, it's just, I mean, there's plenty of people doing great work right now. That's never the problem. Yeah. Plenty of them. You know, I could go on and on listing names of people that you should, everybody should check out their albums, but, um, it's, it's, it's just really deep how the jazz industry has created a certain perception and I don't really understand why all that exists, but I just know as a jazz musician, it's a, 
know, it's, for instance, if you're in a bar and you say something, what do you, somebody asks you what you do for a living, you say, jazz is this, and they start talking about New Orleans, and like, well, you know, <laughs> I mean, that was great, but I don't, that doesn't, that's not a part of my psyche at all, you know, I, yeah, yeah. why do you bring up New Orleans when I mention jazz, you know, or, yeah, so anyway, it, it, it's, it's, and there's been a whole spate of hate jazz articles in some major publications recently that have been kind of very, um, very depressing. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, the music will always survive just because it has to exist. I mean, because there's always a need for people to sit at an instrument and create patterns on the instrument in a lifetime. That, that, that need for improvisation is kind of innate to the human psyche and it'll never go away despite all the problems that exist around the music surviving. Absolutely. So speaking of cities and jazz, you know, Kansas City's known for uh, jazz with the Hall of Fame and the history that we have here. Have you played here in Kansas City much? I don't think I ever have. Wow. Wow. We'd love to, <laughs> we'd love to have you here. <laughs> but the, the Jazz Museum is there, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, I know the person that runs the Jazz Museum is actually a fan of mine, and he's um helped out on a project once, I mean, that where we were able to use the Jazz Museum as a conduit for it, but I've never actually played there and um, or played it even in Kansas, I don't think. Interesting. Um, let me ask you this. Do you, uh, do you live with any regrets? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, probably, but at the same time, you know, it, it, that doesn't help. You know, anything that helps is to get up in the morning and to deal with what, what is and try to get something done. Yeah. So if I, if I do, I don't, I don't dwell on it. You know, I mean, we all have periods of, um, where we, you know, think different things that, you know, it could have been this, if this, and this, but the bottom line is you just got to get up and deal with what it is in the morning and make something of it, so. Absolutely. Um, what's jazz going to sound like 100 years from now? Oh, I have no idea. There's a whole young generation of people whose brains are completely wired different than mine, mainly because they grew up with laptops and iPhones and iPads, and I'm not really privy to how they think, and I'm sure that their whole approach to the music will be completely, completely different. So it's up to them. I have no idea what they're going to come up with. Right on. So let me ask you this, as we cap things off here, getting to know Matthew Shipp, how do you want the world to remember you as both a person and as a musician? Um, as a musician, I just want people to really figure out that I was very sincere when I sat down at the piano and just um, played my heart out with my own ideas and my own language. Um, as a person, I'd rather not people really know that much about me other than that I was dedicated to my art form and you know, that people don't really need to know much about me. Right on. Matthew, thank you, man. I love your work. In fact, I was going to tell you that I picked up your work for the first time at a public library about 15 years ago and was hooked immediately. So to say this is an honor and a pleasure to speak with you would understate it, but I really appreciate you taking your time out and speaking with me today. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over America, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Mr. Matthew Shipp for his music and influence on the world. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store, or for all things Neon Jazz, visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.